the last talk of this workshop for today. <laughs> I want to introduce Gillian Russell, and she will present a variable binary quantifiers and generics. So please. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So I was really um, excited to get invited to this workshop. I am one of the people who came out of um, Roy and Jessica Gordon-Roth's uh, conference on feminist formal logic or feminist philosophy and formal logic. Um, I am not quite sure how I got myself invited to that conference. Like, is it eight years ago now? Oh, six years ago. Um, since I didn't do any work on feminist logic, but I was one of those people who thought, well, I do some work on logic and I'm a feminist. Wouldn't it be really cool if like some of the work you do on logic could be yeah. useful? That would be that would be really exciting. And so I, you know, I wanted to come to this conference and learn more about it. And then since then, I've written um, three different papers about feminist logic. Of course, I wanted to be here because it's such a like exciting um, topic right now. Um, but the paper that would have been most suitable for me to present here, I actually presented here a couple of years back, and so I can't do that. <laughs> and so I was really struggling um, actually for something to talk about. Um, and so, uh, you know, in some ways, what you're getting is a problem for one of the old papers and like an idea about what to do with that problem. And I'll be honest, this is work in progress. I don't have like very clear, very good solutions right now. But I think the problem is like interesting enough on its own that it's like worth listening to a talk about it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make it um, interesting as I go. Okay, so here is the question that I'm gonna be trying to answer. Could variable binary quantifiers give the underlying truth conditions for generic sentences? And what I imagined when I was writing this, or you guys now thinking, I was, uh, what are variable binary quantifiers? Uh, what are generic sentences? And what does any of this have to do with feminist logic? So most of the talk is going to be answering those three questions. Uh, first question, or third question, what does any of this have to do with feminist logic? So I think a lot of people here are grappling with different answers to the question, like what would feminist logic be? And one of the things I argued in a different paper was that it might make sense for us to look to philosophy of science and look at feminist science and see what um, uh, people say there about different ways in which science can be feminist and then see whether any of those ways are applicable to logic. And one of the ways that I find most interesting and most exciting is this idea that science could be feminist if it's about feminist topics, like stuff to do with gender, stuff to do with like, gender hierarchies or gender norms. Um, and you know, this is an idea that you find in um, work by people like Elizabeth Anderson. And you sometimes um, like come across certain examples. So here's, here's just an example of what would count as feminist science on this kind of way of thinking about it. Um, so there are certain studies done um, in sociology that look at what happens when people are recruited to orchestras. So when people are recruited to orchestras, there's usually, usually an audition, um, and there'll be a group of people who are on the like recruitment panel and they're listening to the audition. And it turns out that if you make the people audition behind a screen so that you can hear, hear them, but you can't see them, and in particular, you don't know what their gender is, then many more women get through to the next round in the recruitment process. Right? So that's like really interesting about um, you know, the way people make um, decisions socially, um, certainly uh, relevant to women. And so if you have serious studies of this kind of phenomena, this seems like it would count as, as feminist science. Okay, so could there be logic the study feminist topics. It was about feminist topics. And you might think, um, if you come from a certain sort of background in logic, well, it's really hard to see how that could work, mainly because logic's not supposed to be about anything. So certainly if you're sort of 
working downstream from Wittgenstein's Tractatus, from multiple positivism, you might have this thought that, you know, logic is not metaphysical, it's not supposed to be about anything. Um, and so it's just not the sort of topic that could be feminist in that way. So those kind of ideas in logic, they ruled out a lot more than just feminism. So one thing that you didn't get a lot of um, in those situations uh, was certain kinds of modal logic. And when I try to think about logics that we study now that could be said to be about things, well, a pretty natural thing to say is that elitic modal logics are about like, possibility and necessity. Uh, maybe epistemic logics are about knowledge and belief and stuff like that. Maybe mathematical logics about arithmetic, things like this. It's fairly um, natural examples of logic being about things in a fairly natural way. Okay. So if you don't just sort of start with the assumption that logic can't be about anything, and you try to look at some like good examples of logic, um, it does seem to be that you can have logics that are about things in some ways. Okay, but could there be a logic that's about feminist topics? Well, here's kind of a, a key thought for me. Um, logic is really uh, good and has some track record at studying ordering relations. Right, so we do that in mathematical logic. Um, it's also something that you see in, say, counterfactual logic. So I'm thinking of like David Lewis style logics for counterfactuals, where you have possible worlds in this domain, and then those possible worlds are ordered by this relation of similarity to the actual world. Okay, so we have this ordering relation in the model. And then you could think, well, if we can study possible worlds ordered uh, by similarity, couldn't we study people ordered by like social hierarchies? Or uh, couldn't we study groups of people ordered by like social hierarchies like men, women, or like different racial groups, uh, gay people, straight people, these kinds of things. Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of um, uh, the background um, idea here. And what we're going to get to with me explaining the variable binary quantifier part, so this would be like moving on to uh, question one and from question three is, um, you know, what, what are they? What, what would that kind of look like? Okay. Um, so to start out, not with variable binary quantifiers, but just with binary quantifiers. So the kind of quantifiers you get in first order logic, like just the for all x, f of x, those are unary quantifiers. They're unary in the following sense. What it takes to make a quantifier plus a variable into a full formula is you have to add another formula, right? Usually that's a formula with a free variable, so it might be like a predicate like fx, we might call it a predicate, right? Um, but when you look at natural languages, so there's some English sentences here, it often seems like quantifiers like all and some, they take two predicates, or they take two open formulas to form um, a sentence in this case. So uh, it's not just everything's a kookaburra, but all kookaburras are noisy. So there's the predicate is a kookaburra, and the predicate is noisy. Uh, some kookaburras are noisy, no kookaburras are noisy, most kookaburras are noisy, few kookaburras are noisy, half of all kookaburras are noisy, you get the idea, right? It seems to take um, two predicates. And in a formal language, binary quantifiers mimic this aspect of natural language syntax. So instead of having the quantifier followed by the variable followed by just one formula, like gap of x, instead you have two formulas, and we're putting them in brackets here so you can see that they both belong to this quantifier. So phi might be, say, f of x, and psi might be g of x, right? Um, and so you can have a universal binary quantifier, you can have an existential binary quantifier, but you can also have all kinds of generalized quantifiers, like most and the and half. Okay. If we think of each of the two predicates as having an extension on the domain, so like picking out a set of objects, then we can often specify the truth conditions for the binary quantifiers in terms of the relationship between those sets. So these little double square brackets here 
I'm using for kind of the semantic value of the expression. So when it's a full sentence like this, it's the truth value of the sentence, so that would be equal to one. If and only if, but if you just got an open formula, that might pick out a set. And if you just got an individual constant, that might pick out a denotation on the domain. Okay, so this uh, binary universal quantifier for all C um, phi psi will be true if and only if the set of things that satisfy phi is a subset of the set of things that satisfy psi. Okay, all the Fs are G. Like. But then if we do the existential one, well, what you need there is that at least one of the Fs is G, so the intersection of those two sets, the Fs and the Gs, is not empty. Okay. Um, if I was, you know, writing down a paper or something like that, I would have a few more subscripts knocking around here. There'd be a subscript for the model, subscript from assignments. I'm just leaving that stuff out for, for reading. Okay, so those are binary quantifiers, examples of binary quantifiers, but they're not variable binary quantifiers. So in this little table on the quantifier column, we've got regular unary quantifiers that you all know from the first order logic. We've got these binary quantifiers um, that we've just been looking at. They're binary, but they're strict. And then what I really want to talk about is uh, variable binary quantifiers, and here just to sort of dis disambiguate them, I'm sometimes putting 2v in, so that you know they're binary, but also variable. And one of the easiest ways to see what the variable binary quantifiers are supposed to be is to see that they are analogous to the counterfactual errors. This is the word counterfactual from Lewis's um, counterfactual logics. So in some ways, a modal operator like the box is a sort of universal quantifier. It quantifies over all the possible worlds, but it's just a unary quantifier. So if you have a box, it just takes one sentence to make it a sentence, right? But if you have a strict conditional, well, now that takes two sentences to make a sentence, you an antecedent and a consequence. Um, and so this is interpreted something like necessarily if P then Q, um, and so now you're quantifying over all the worlds and saying like all the P worlds have to be uh, Q worlds, right? In order for this kind of thing to come out true. That's a little bit like this universal quantifier that takes two predicates and what has to happen is uh, all the F things have to be G things in order for this to come out true. <clears throat> okay, a bit more complicated are these uh, counterfactual arrows because in this case, we need models that have possible worlds that are ranked by the similarity relation in order to give their truth conditions. So with counterfactuals, here is um, a statement of the truth conditions for, for that counterfactual. It's a bit complicated. There's two clauses. But we say that um, if A were the case, then B would be the case. Or, a box arrow B, that is true at some world W, if and only if either clause one, no A world, there's no world where A is true, belongs to any sphere S in this system of spheres, dollar sign W. Actually, you know, maybe that's something I could have left out for readability, right? We're not going to need to talk about W and the dollar sign very much. Um, or, and now here's actually the most important clause. Some sphere S in that system contains at least one A world, and within S, all the A worlds are B worlds. That is, if A then B holds in every, every world. Okay, that's that's a bit uh, wordy. Here is a way to like kind of get your head around it if you don't know it already. So the first clause in those truth conditions tells you about the vacuous case. So what happens if there's no A worlds or no A worlds are close enough to really be of interest. Well, then it's like the counterfactual is sort of trivially true, right? So this is the what was called the vacuous true case, right? We've got this counterfactual um, A box arrow B that comes out true in this model um, because uh, there are no A worlds in any of these spheres. So these circles represent the spheres. 
W in the middle, that's the actual world. And then as you get further and further out from the actual world and further spheres, you are less similar to the actual world. So these spheres like order the possible worlds for us. Okay. Um, but then it's also the case that um, you know there are no A worlds in any of these spheres, and so A box are not B, what Lewis sometimes calls the opposite counterfactual. That comes out trivially true as well. Okay. So that's sort of the, the boring case. And the interesting case is non-vacuous truth. So here A box R of B comes out true again, but this time there are some A worlds in some sphere in the system, right? So in this red area, all those things. So A worlds, and you can find a sphere. And so I'm not used to using these things at all, so I should stand back and actually use it. This sphere that I'm pointing at here, which is like in this model, the smallest sphere that has any A worlds in it, right? And when you look at that sphere, all the worlds that are A are overlapped by B, right? So all those worlds are B worlds. And so within that sphere, all the A worlds are B worlds, right? And if we go back to the truth conditions, that's the non vacuous condition for being true. So some sphere S contains at least one A world and all the A worlds are B worlds within that sphere. Okay. But then there can be A worlds which are not B worlds, they're just further out. So you know, in here, this section here, there are some A worlds that are not overlapped by the B section, right? So you have A worlds that are not B worlds. Um, the opposite counterfactual that comes out false here that says, you know, if A were the case, then not B would be the case, but of course we checked. If A were the case, B would be the case. And so that's not false. Okay, and then there's two ways to make the counterfactual false. There might be a sphere that has some A worlds and none of those A worlds are B worlds, right? And then if A were the case, then B would not be the case. That comes out true, so the opposite one comes out false. Or it might just be this kind of mixed up in that innermost sphere. There's some a worlds and some of those A worlds are B worlds and some of them are not. And in that case, both of the counterfactuals, the counterfactual and its opposite, they both come out false. Okay. So that's our analogy for the variable binary quantifiers. Um, one of the reasons that um, I find this like promising as an analogy for like feminist logic is that you actually get a logic out of it that's different. It's not different in the sense that it's non-classical, like relevant logic is non-classical or FDE is non-classical. Um, the base can be um, completely classical in this case, but what does happen is like in say modal logic, we add some new logical constant, in this case, the box arrow, right? And it gets truth conditions that, you know, pick out stuff that's going on um, in this model, and now you can write sentences using that logical constant and ask, you know, what's the consequence of that sentence? What does it follow from? Um, and you get like interesting new answers because you have a new logical expression, right? Okay, so one of the things, I think this is what comes next in the slides. Yeah. One of the things that Lewis pointed out is that entailment patterns that work with a strict conditional fail with a counterfactual conditional. So I'm just going to give you um, his three examples um, here. And so one of the atomic patterns is strengthening the antecedent. So if you have like a normal strict conditional of you know, boxed arrow, uh, and so you've got you know uh, necessarily if A then B, and then you add some antecedent there, so necessarily A and B, then C, um, then that's going to be valid. Right? Um, but with the counterfactual, that doesn't always work. So here's the entailment pattern with the, the counterfactual. Here's kind of a natural language example to sort of help you sort of feel it. Um, so Lewis thinks the following uh, sentence is true. If kangaroos didn't have tails, then they would fall over. Right? So the tails are pretty big on a kangaroo, it helps them balance. If you would take the tail off, then the kangaroo would fall over. Right? And you know, what he's thinking is 
Okay, where's, you know, what's the closest, the world most similar to ours where kangaroos don't have tails, right? Oh, now they're really unbalanced if you just take them their tail away, right? And so they, they fall over, right? But we might add some, like further close to the antecedent, um, maybe the kangaroos can use crutches, right? They've got pretty, pretty strong arms, they can probably support themselves on the, the crutches. Um, well, then they wouldn't fall over, okay? Um, and so the, the strengthened conditional comes up false, right? And what's happening in the sort of more formal way of thinking about it is the closest possible world where kangaroos don't have tails, that's like in here, but in the closest possible world where kangaroos don't have tails and use crutches, that's, that's less similar to the actual world, right? So it's further out here, and in that sphere, some of the A worlds are, are not B worlds, as it can actually comes out false. Okay, so strengthening the antecedent, that fails with counterfactual conditionals. Counterfactual transitivity, it turns out that fails as well. Um, here's a famous example from Lewis. If J. Edgar Hoover had been Russian, then he would have been a communist. And the thought is that's true, you know, as a person, he was, you know, very uh, conservative to his own society. And so if he, if he grew up in Russia, he would have been a communist. Um, if J. Edgar Hoover had been a communist, he would have been a traitor, right? Because, uh, you know, the most similar world to ours, where J. Edgar Hoover is a communist, he grew up in the U.S., um, he turned out to be a communist, he would have been a, he would have been a traitor. Um, so then, transitivity, if J. Edgar Hoover had been Russian, he would have been a traitor, but that's false, right? We're thinking if he'd been Russian, he would have been a, a communist, which would not have made him a traitor. Okay. And then this last uh, fallacy, contraposition, uh, is at least one example of contraposition. Um, if A were the case, then uh, B would be the case. Uh, so if not B were the case, then not A would be the case, right? Um, so here's the example. Um, Boris is avoiding the party because he wants to avoid Olga. Okay? So kind of factual, if Boris had gone to the party, then Olga would have gone. So Boris doesn't go, but if he'd gone, Olga would have, would have been there, right? Uh, conclusion, if Olga hadn't gone to the party, Boris would not have gone, but that could be false because, you know, he might have gone and, you know, if he realized that she wasn't going. Okay, so composition fails with, with these kinds of kind of factions. Okay, these, these fallacy examples are just in there to sort of emphasize the different logic, different consequence relation, at least Interestingly, new consequence relation as a result of these kinds of expressions. Okay. So variable binary quantifiers, right? Uh, one way to think about this is to like start with a model theory. So think of the big circle out here. That's like the domain of the model. And then there's all these, let's just say people in the domain, all these individuals, um, and we're gonna order them like by this like social hierarchy relation, right? So this logic is gonna be in some way sort of about social um, ordering relations. Um, and then we want something that's a bit like a Louisian counterfactual um, that uses that ordering relation to get its truth conditions. And we want to smack into the problem that, um, you know, sentences are true relative to worlds, but, uh, and it's not that they're true relative to people, or at least unless you're a kind of very special extreme relativist, but it's not like every sentence is a true value relative to a person. Right? And so you're like, oh, are we stuck? Is that, is that going to like ruin this? Well, we could say, you know, sentences don't get truth values relative to people, but like open sentences, like unit you know, predicates, they do, right? So if you have a predicate like is tall, that's satisfied by some people and not satisfied by others. And so you can think about the extension of a predicate on a domain, even if you can't think about the extension of a sentence on a, on a domain, right? Okay, so then if we have like two predicates, but you can't join them with a counterfactual arrow, I will say you can't. I mean, what's sort of uh, the most natural thing to reach for syntactically is a quantifier a quantifier that takes two different predicates to form a sentence, so a binary quantifier. And what we need is a binary quantifier whose truth conditions are sensitive to this ordering relation, 
Right, so, so we talk about spheres the way that the counterfactual truth condition sort of is. Okay, so we've got this uh, for all to be this binary universal quantifier in this case. There could be lots of others, like special ones and most and things. Um, it is going to come out true if and only if either, and then there's the vacuous case, there are no eight people, right? Or the non vacuous case, there's some individual in some sphere who is A. And within that sphere, so restricted to that sphere, all the A's of B's. So there would be this vacuous case where there aren't any F's, and so we've got um, all F's of G. That comes out true just because there's no F's. Okay. And then we have the non-vacuous case where there are some F's, and uh, uh, for all that all F's of G comes out true because there is this sphere, third one in, where there are some F's, and within that sphere, all the things that are F's are G. Right? A further out, we have some F things that are not G, like in this tiny triangle here, and that doesn't matter. Right? It would matter if we had a normal strict binary universal quantifier, right? But because this looks at the, like, the closest in sphere, if you like, where there are some Fs and says, in that sphere are all the Fs. Gee, this variable universal quantifier comes out true, um, even though there are some Fs in the not G. Okay. So now we have like a new logical expression, right, that um, is going to behave differently from a regular universal quantifier. And it's like sensitive to social stuff in the model, this social. Uh, ranking relation, okay, there's some falsity stuff. Okay, and so what I suggested in like my previous social spheres paper that I gave last time I was here, um, is there might be some kind of um, quantifiers that we use in natural languages that are somehow like really sensitive to social hierarchy such that we tend to be like favoring talking about the people often at the top of the hierarchy. Um, and then can examples further down the hierarchy just get ignored? And so some sort of cases might be, you might think, uh, so in 1910 in Australia, uh, women were permitted to vote throughout the country. And so you might be tempted to say, well, uh, all women are allowed to vote in Australia now, back in the day, right? But uh, indigenous suffrage lagged behind women's suffrage. And so, in fact, there were uh, women in Australia who were not permitted to vote. But you can still imagine, you know, someone going around saying, well, all women are allowed to vote in Australia now because they're kind of ignoring uh, some of the more marginalized cases. Right. So that was, that was kind of what I was thinking. So here are, here are some examples of English quantifiers that I intended to say could be interpreted with these kinds of expressions. So. Everyone from the manor goes up to London for the season. Okay. You can imagine somebody saying that in this kind of Downton Abbey sort of scenario where that means, you know, the wealthy family who live in the manor, not all the servants and the, um, other people who, who live there, they're just, that's not who we're talking about, right? It's just the um, people at sort of top of the hierarchy. Um, everyone should have a gun used by a racist NRA supporter who doesn't mean to include members of the Black Panthers. And like they wouldn't, they wouldn't really regard this as a counter example. They, everyone should own a gun, but I'm not talking. That's not who I. You know, they're just not being counted. Uh, all men are created equal. Written by a slave owner named Jefferson. Um, uh, and then this is really my favorite example. Many men, of course, became extremely rich, but this was perfectly natural and nothing to be ashamed of because no one was really poor. At least no one worth speaking of. <laughs> so that's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. All right, so there's an idea, it's the idea that I pushed um, in that paper, but here's the thing, there's lots of ways you could resist it, right? So one thing that sometimes happens is people really want to stick to the strict interpretation of the quantifiers and they're like, no, people said all men are created equal, but that was just false, right? And maybe what you might say is that what's going on here is the sentence is false, but there's a kind of loose talk that gets used. So similarly to when I say, I don't know, there's, there's nothing in the fridge, and somebody says, uh, aren't there atoms in the fridge? Isn't there air in the fridge? Right? What about that ketchup? Right? And what I mean, I'm, I was speaking loosely. There's nothing. 
but we want to eat for dinner in the fridge. Um, or, I mean, you know, the uh, the alternative that Lewis had to fight with his uh, counterfactual arrows is maybe these are just strict quantifiers that get interpreted differently depending on the context. Right? And so maybe this is just a variation in the context of um, uh, quantificational um, domain, and that explains kind of what's going on um, in these scenarios without the need for this complicated stuff. Um, however, especially when I gave this talk when there were like linguists around, people sometimes said, yeah, I'm not sure I believe this for say the universal quantifier in English, right? Yeah, of course you can have this logic, but you know, whether, whether this is really something that we express in English, um, but maybe for generics. So here's the second question that I sort of brought up at the beginning of the talk. Um, what are generics, right? And then that gets you to my question, could it be that binary variable quantifiers are giving us the truth conditions for generic sentences? Okay. So there's gonna be this little section um, with some sort of just background about generics. A lot of this is taken from Josh Deva and Herbert Gapellan's book, uh, Bad Language. It has a really cool section on generics and sort of especially political uses of generics. Okay, so um, here are some examples of generics. Um, they uh, sort of important distinguishing characteristic. They don't have any overt quantifier at the beginning, and yet they're sort of quantifying over uh, some domain. So we've got um, birds fly, uh, sharks are dangerous, immigrants are treated quite well in Australia. One of the reasons um, generics are politically interesting is that they're the kind of thing that um, uh, people are quite often surveyed on to figure out their political opinions. So people might, you know, like polit politicians might send out surveys to the people in their constituency, um, and they say, so consider this sentence, immigrants are treated quite well in Australia. <laughs> and then there's a look at scale for, you know, do you strongly agree with this sentence? Do you somewhat agree with this sentence? Uh, or do you disagree with this sentence and, and how much, right? Um, and there's kind of some interesting features um, of these cases. I mean, one thing that's obvious with the birds fly case is that generics tolerate exceptions. So penguins don't fly, emus don't fly, right? But you can still say uh, birds fly, and that can be generically true, right? Um, sharks are dangerous. Uh, I mean, lots of sharks are not dangerous. Like, you know, not, certainly not dangerous um, to human beings. Um, and the percentage of sharks that are dangerous is very, very small. Um, immigrants are treated quite well in Australia. This is a good one, I think, for making the point that um, it's not required that every immigrant is treated quite well in Australia. So this sentence would be true, even if we can give like one particular example of an immigrant who is not treated well. Um, uh, but it is going to require like more than just one immigrant being treated well, right? So in some ways, it seems like less than a universal claim, but more than an existential claim. Okay. Yeah. So not every sentence that has that kind of bare plural on the front is actually a generic. Um, so here, prime numbers have exactly two factors. I think that really should be understood saying every prime number has exactly two factors. So it's not just a generic claim, it's a universal claim. Laura Keats ate the fruit from my tree. That really is an existential claim, like some Laura Keats ate, ate the fruit from my tree. Um, and then dinosaurs are extinct isn't really a quantum functional claim at all. It's really about the kind of dinosaurs that, that it's gone. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with the bare plurals, even though that's the standard way to express um, generic. Okay, and so this slide I think just has some of the sort of characteristic features of generic. So we had exception tolerance, birds fly. That's a true generic, even though emus don't. Um, the fact that they're often weaker than universals, but stronger than existentials. So immigrants are treated well in Australia as an example <laughs> um, for that. But then also, weirdly, sometimes they're stronger than universals. So suppose the following is true. Supreme Court justices have social security numbers, which are primed. 
Okay, that's wild. Okay, um, maybe there was like even numbers or something. Okay, now even if that's true, that would be a really weird thing to say. It's sort of problematic as a generic because presumably it's accidental, right? It's not like you get assigned that kind of um, social security number if you're a Supreme Court justice, and so it seems to be saying more than what's actually true, which is merely that Supreme Court justices have social security numbers which are prime. Okay, lots of generics seem like most claims. So basketball player is a tool or birds fly, seems pretty similar to most claims, uh, but some of them don't. So for example, platypus lay eggs, and see I've got lots of Australian um, examples in here. Um, that's a true generic, even though only the female platypuses lay eggs. So it's not like most platypuses lay eggs. Um, Australians are right-handed, that's really weird. Like, we don't go around saying, oh, did you know Australians are right-handed, right? Even though 90% of Australians are right-handed, why? Well, it seems like we're suggesting some kind of connection between being Australian and being right-handed, um, and then it's not there. Uh, ticks carry Lyme disease. So it turns out that only 1% of ticks carry Lyme disease, which is a tiny fraction of them. But it often seems that Generics are like they can be asserted with less evidence or with a, with a smaller percentage of the things satisfying the second predicate in cases that are sort of to do with danger or where it's an especially remarkable property. Um, so we've got sharks attack swimmers. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, but only a tiny, tiny fraction of sharks um, attack swimmers. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is interesting experimental work about generics. So this sentence here, the morsets have silver fur. Uh, there's no such thing as a morset, it's a made up expression for use in this experiment. And so what the experimenters do is they tell people about this creature they don't know about called a morset, and then they ask them, is it true that morsets have silver, have silver fur? Or they, they give them this sentence and say, is it true? So they ask them for the truth of the generic. Um, sometimes they tell them that, say, 5% of morsefs have silver fur in the sort of background information. Sometimes they tell them, like, all morsefs have simple silver fur. But they were looking for the threshold at which people would say it was true that morsefs have silver fur. The data is, you know, a little bit chaotic. People will say yes in different places. But on average, uh, people will accept the sentence if 69% of morsefs have silver fur. Okay, separate experiment with different population, different people. Um, you tell people that morsefs have silver fur, and you ask them to estimate what percentage of morsefs have silver fur. Um, and the average is 90% <laughs> of what they can add in. That's really interesting because they seem to accept the sentence at a much lower percentage. Um, but if they believe that they have, that more sets have silver fur, then they will infer this much stronger claim that 90% of more sets um, have silver fur. And so it seems like generics encourage bad reasoning patterns, and this is especially likely to happen um, in a sort of social situation where testimony is an intermediate step. So, you know, we're, we're going off exploring the Morsef's population and we discover that 69% of Morsef's have silver fur. We come back to our community and we say Morsef's have silver fur. And everyone goes around believing that, you know, probably 90% of Morsef's have silver fur, right? <laughs> um, so, that's, you know, that's, that's not uh, justified by the initial um, evidence. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, that experimental effect is much stronger with the remarkable or dangerous properties, all right? So things like, you know, sharks attack people and uh, uh, ticks carry uh, whatever virus it was, um, Lyme disease, right? Okay, so now consider what that might mean for political, for politically important senses like this. Arabs are terrorists. Right, how many Arabs would have to be terrorists before that becomes an acceptable uh, generic to assert? Um, and then, if you can say that kind of thing, how many Arabs are you allowed to believe have terrorists? You know, it's generally accepted that Arabs are terrorists. 
or black men are dangerous, or uh, women lie. At this point, I can barely give a talk without mentioning XKCD. So uh, it always reminds me of uh, this cartoon where there's a guy writing some math on the board, and this other guy says, Wow, you suck at math. But then there's a girl writing math on the board, and instead of saying, Wow, you suck at math, he says, Wow, girls suck at math. Straight to the generic. Okay. All right. So, you know, here's, here's you know, I'm saying the whole will be saying the question, but this is the question. Um, could it be that the truth conditions are generics? A given by the variable binary quantifiers. Um, and like one of the things I've been trying to think about is like, how could we decide? Like, what kind of things would be useful um, to know? I mean, one thing we can say is look, generics tolerate exceptions, and so do these variable uh, binary quantifiers. So that seems like a you know a nice explanation of why generics tolerate the exceptions. Um, the problem is going to be that there are going to be lots of different theories of the meaning of generics, right? So maybe they could be uh, like universal quantifiers in some cases where we restrict the domain of quantification, um, or uh, maybe it could be loose talk in some respects. So we're saying false things, but, um, but you're allowed to say false things in some circumstances. Maybe there's like contextual variation of various kinds. There's going to be contextual variation in the case of the variable binary quantifiers. So we're going to have to like figure out a way to sort out or like see if there's a way to test whether it's variable binary quantifiers plus contextual variation in which ordering relation we're picking out or whether it's merely contextual uh, variation in which domain um, we're talking about. Um, but, you know, one thing we could look at is those um, patterns of fallacious reasoning that we got with the counterfactual errors, um, you also get those patterns with the variable binary quantifiers. That is, sort of quantifier contraposition doesn't work, uh, transitivity doesn't work, and um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, so it was uh, strengthening the antecedents, so it would be like strengthening the restrictor in the, the case of the quantifiers. Um, so, and this is definitely the part of the talk that's just um, very, very much early stage work in progress. Um, here is an argument constructed using generics. We've got <laughs> birds fly. It's true, right? So, even use the birds, that's true as well. Uh, apply transitivity, so even use fly. But that's false. Okay. So it uh, seems like generics exhibit this pattern of um, uh, failure of sensitivity. You know, one possible explanation for that is well, they're variable binary quantifiers, right? I don't, even look at something, I don't know what to make of this, but um, when I was thinking about this like yesterday, um, it seems to me that this also a fallacious argument that has the same structure as this one is more likely to be used, right? It's less obviously fallacious. So this time liars can't be trusted, women lie, so women can't be trusted, right? I, could, I can imagine a lawyer making that argument and not being stopped, right? Whereas it's really clear with the bird's fly case that that doesn't work. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna say right now is that's striking. Um, okay, what about other fallacies? Um, while well, strengthening the restrictor, cardinals are red. So cardinals are the red birds that you get in the US. But you put them on uh, you know, Christmas cards and things because they're beautiful uh, red birds. Um, female cardinals are red. Well, the female cardinals actually aren't red, they're brown. Right? So um, that's false. And all we've done there is like added another predicate into uh, the um, antecedent predicate, the restrictor. Um, so that's the quantifier equivalent of strengthening the antecedent, and it takes you from um, true to false. Um, I don't think I have like a comparable one with that. Okay, this is probably um, the last slide, which is just to note that it's actually a bit hard to generate natural sounding examples of contraposition. 
Um, I wasn't uh, like very successful doing it, but you might take a generic like swans or white, um, and then like the sort of way to contrapose is to say non-white things aren't swans, and like yeah, that, that seems weird, but then also it doesn't seem like a natural English sentence. It sounds like glossaries or some kind of sort of study in philosophy of science when you're talking about the paradox of the ravens, but it's um, it doesn't feel like a very like natural generic. Okay, um, but I also thought that with more loaded, like politically loaded counterexamples, um, I sometimes feel that the contrapositive is implied, that that's some, what somebody is trying to tell you. So when somebody says, boys don't cry, they might seem to be telling you that, um, well, if you're crying, you're not a boy, you're a girl, maybe. Um, or, and this, this is, really stuck in my head because there was a billboard in Missouri where um, somebody paid to have this written on the billboard <laughs> in the middle of the country. They said, real men provide, real women are grateful. <laughs> okay. And the suggestion seems to be, you know, if you're a man and you don't provide, then you're not a real man. And if you're a woman and you're not grateful, then you're not a real woman. Right? Um, and so there, there seems to be this almost like, um, at least conversational implication of the um, um, content positive. And so maybe we're getting like some examples of other kinds of um, bad reasoning with uh, generics, um, like especially happening in the sort of remarkable and dangerous cases, which is kind of interesting. Okay. Yeah, that was the last slide, because my only references to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to stop on. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Hi. Awesome, Helen. Um, I, I recall about conditional logic is a little bit rusty, but uh, are, are there are there extensions in which you've got the failure of string theme and even and such, but you do get composition? Are there other semantic constraints you can put on on spheres that support contradiction or the contraposition? And would that be the kind of thing that you'd be important to pick one of fire the case? Um so I don't know. Uh maybe what would I want to? It seems that you are picking out some class of sentences, some classes of generics that do contrapose, but that doesn't work in a purely like sort of Lewis Adams sense. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that wasn't how I was thinking of it. Um, so, uh, I thought you were pointing out a disanalogy in here. Maybe, maybe that's what I should have been doing. Um, The, the way I was thinking of it is there, like, we already know that generics encourage certain bad patterns of reasoning, a um, lot with the more sets, right? Um, and um, that the effect is especially strong um, with sort of dangerous and remarkable stuff like um, Arabs and terrorists or um, um, cases like that, women, women love. Um, and so I was thinking that what this was an example of was the um, uh, effects being stronger, being people being more tempted by the bad reasoning um, in the political uh, cases. Um, but yeah, I don't really know that I understand what's going on in the room. So I mean, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's how she's thinking about it. There's a way to. Um, I don't know, change the order of the year position. Um, but we also, we did have the fact with transitivity, right? That like fallacious line of reasoning, but it somehow seems it's less obviously fallacious in the strong case. So yeah, I mean, if, if I went this way, I wonder if I'd have to go the same way with, with transitivity. I maybe I misunderstood kind of the project. I mean, I, I, I sort of interpret it as uh, providing a semantics for these utterances, even if they support fallacious 
patterns of reasoning if they don't provide the logic of what someone is saying at least they provide more clarity into what they're trying to express um and so i i, I sort of assumed then that you've got this sort of disunity with the lewis adams case that finding a semantic constraint would help say okay well when people are making these sort of impassioned utterances like men provide this is what the speaker's meaning is it's, and i can semantic it, semantically model it in this way so I, I guess maybe i can have understood the assumption what you're coming yeah so i mean well, just while you were talking there i was thinking look, here's a really terrible project right i could try to um reconstruct the fallacious logic right so i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to uh, you know, people people reason from one plus one equals two to uh, women lie, right? And um, I'll come up with a logic on which that's valid, um, and then that will explain the their behavior. Yeah, I mean, is, it, is it a terrible project though? I mean, well, if I want to understand okay. the the mindset of somebody that put up that billboard, it's this thing, if that's really the truth conditions for the um, expression, it's not it's not fallacious, right? But, but one possibility, so this, this I think is sympathetic to your, your thought, um, which is, I mean, suppose it would be valid if you ignored a certain class of models. Um, so if you if you failed to pay attention to some models, it would have, you know, it seems to come out valid. But, um, uh, and, and maybe like the high priority cases make people focus on um, certain models and forget certain camera examples. Um, and in that case, you might be able to explain their behavior and also say the argument's not valid. It's not valid because there are these counter models, um, but they, they, like the explanation of their behavior is that they failed to attention. Yeah, it, it strikes me that I, there's a difference between saying your reasoning is fallacious here, uh, and this is why, and saying I can understand what you're trying to do. And this is where you are going from. I mean, it does seem like subtly different, but one is only available if you have that bad logic. I mean, the other thing you could be saying is you're what you're going where you're going wrong is you're mistaking a variable quantifier for a strict quantifier, um, like you're mistaking a counterfactual for a, a strict um, conditional, um, and that would be like a different way um, to explain the behavior. Although they might turn around and say, "I meant the strict conditional all wrong." Yeah. Very full stops. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I um I honestly haven't got it quite straight in my own head yet. Um, we have a, a brief comment about the question. Okay. Yeah. Um. Thank you for your talk. I think it was awesome. Um. I remember that once upon a time. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. I was pretty sure with uh very similar things like this, and then what really has point is that I can get it to go like anywhere. Um. So it was really inspiring. And I was thinking, uh, now that Thomas brought up uh, like the uh, thing with contraposition, that the counter example struck me as problematic, not because of uh, the commitment, like to the contraposity uh, statement, but maybe because the reason that the inference feels implied is that it's a similar case to vacuously true conditionals, right? Because I was thinking about how, like, uh, people who don't believe that these statements are true diffuse these kinds of situations, right? So if any uh, anyone approaches me and tells me that boys don't cry, I'm not gonna believe that. But I'm also gonna reply something that, well, then um, if boys don't cry, then perhaps I'm okay with being a girl, right? Nothing wrong with crying, yeah. Yeah, nothing wrong with uh, crying, then therefore being a girl. But that's because um, I know that because I don't believe like the conditional, no, the sentence on, on top is true. You're right. It's, it's not, obviously not sound. Yeah. yeah never mind. Is, yeah. Okay. If we're going to like focus on the validity of my inference, well, then yeah, I'm committed to uh, believing that people could, people could do cry. I will go. Um, and it was even more evident with it. It's a second example, right? Because uh, I was thinking of oh, then perhaps I don't want to be a real woman, right? If I have to be committed to great women, then perhaps I don't want to be a real woman. And that's not really an issue. 
with control position being valid, but I think it's a natural concern because for several other reasons we have found uh, vicariously through conditionals to be problematic. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, you're right, there's, there's sort of a confounding issue here, which is we don't believe the antecedent anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, we so maybe right. that's a sort of complicating feature of the example, and I need to find an example with a better um, premise. Um, yeah, because I'm uh, thinking that if I actually were that person who faces his path that I've created on a billboard, <laughs> I would be committed to well, like, right, they believe that. that real men provide and real women are grateful. And then I should have no issue of believing that uh, if you those who don't provide are real men. Yeah. Yeah, that way. Yeah, good. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure how this actually affects the stuff that came later in the talk, but the example you had about the experiment with the made up animal and the yeah. generic, I don't find that data puzzling at all. Um, in fact, I think that data is sort of what you would expect. Um, and, and the fact is, I mean, you're asking two very different sorts of questions there. The first question is, what, so, you know, we've got this generic, like you, a lot of your examples make clear, generics have perhaps more to do with some kind of special connection than with the particular percentage of correlations. Um, but then I mean, we'll have to make judgments like this. So the first question is asking what percentage of correlation is um, sufficient for it to be rational to believe that the generic holds. That can be 69. And that's consistent with thinking that the answer to the second question, which is asking, oh, you know, if the generic holds, then in general, you know, on average of all the different generics that hold, um, kind of what percentage on average would you expect of the correlation to hold given that it, given that the generic is true? And that could be nine. Those are, and I think you can give an easy Bayesian like little model that'll show that. Um, the worry and what makes it look really funny is it looks like it's, it's it looks like it's justifying a very weird inference, right? Sixty nine percent the generic holds, so I should expect nine. Right, that's definitely not true. Really no, well, there are plenty of much less mysterious cases like this, right? Um, just have a hundred cups down and ask somebody um, how many cups, you know, there, there's might be, for each cup, there might be a ball under it. Um, or maybe make it something more natural or something. Or like, how many cups do I have to uncover before you believe there's a, you know, it's, it's likely there's a cup under every ball if I'm picking the cups randomly, right? That number is going to be less than a hundred. But then once they're committed to that, if they believe there's a cup under every ball, they're going to say yes. And now I expect a hundred percent, right? Um, and I think it's just a more complicated version of the same thing. Uh, but I don't think I don't really actually see any anywhere where we're losing that example or the puzzling that's of it. Like, I mean, you still lose the truth preserving of stringing those two together. But I'm I'm not sure. I just think maybe maybe that just maybe that is still data for you to explain. But I don't think it's weird. I actually think if yeah. you thought about right, it's actually what you would expect. Okay, so yeah. I mean, these people are not batteries. Is my point. The point of this section is kind of like introduction to generics and some of the weird things about it. And like some of this data is like some of the experiments are pretty interesting. And I do think that there is um, this sort of a like social philosophy of language or um, social epistemology um, issue here where you could easily um, see that, you know, so maybe the scientists speak in terms of percentages. Uh, they write in their their articles that like sixty nine percent of mothers have silver fur, and the journalists report, "Oh, mothers have silver fur," and then people read that, and then you know they you know if they're asked no. how many right, they would they would say, "Ah, oh, maybe ninety percent, right?" And there's, there's definitely been some like, loss of um, uh, information, um, and people are believing things that aren't true. It's, you know, it's like a result yeah. a result of this like natural bridge between two. Things. When you first presented it, I thought it was the contrast of the two numbers that seemed most puzzling. Whereas it struck me the numbers could well be right. And I think that's exactly it. It's that there's with the two inferences, you're encouraging the two yeah. inferences in, together in a way that's illegitimate. And then it's yeah. so the interesting fact that it's like especially pronounced with dangerous and remarkable properties. Um, and then those properties can be especially troublesome in political situations. Um, that, that does seem to give you a sort of pathway of how bad beliefs can get into the population. Um, and so that's, I, especially given that we're addressing like feminist and political applications of what we show. 
Yeah, but I'm not claiming that these people are irrational or they don't understand the yeah. or anything. That's kind of sorry. That's how I got to go when you okay. went through it quite earlier. So yeah, cool. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, this was great. Okay, I like you, Sean. Um, can we go back to the transitivity? Uh, Would you like transitivity of counterfactuals or transitivity of quantifiers? Uh, of of generics, uh, the one with the, the, end. the liar, the, the women lie, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, so you're, you're trying to draw a contrast between these two cases, but Emus or Gertz is not a generic, right? That is just uh, Emus or Gertz. Oh, you think that's universal? Yes, I'm thinking that is universal. I think that is the reason why you don't find that people would not find that as complicated or confusing as the, as the previous one because they don't need to make adjustments of spheres, right? You just, you know, that bird, because you know the birds fly are. Uh, because you know that animals are the birds that do not fly, and you cannot say the same about like women, that women are people who lie but can be trusted. Okay, no, I see the point about the music birds could be um, like an implicit universal claim, so um, maybe I need to rethink that example. Okay, yeah, because I, I think, in, I, I mean, for what I know of generics, I'm more than willing to bet that Transitivity is going to be complicated for, for generics in general, not just for uh, more politically charged ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I was going to this example also, and uh, I'm just wondering if the, the contrast you see hasn't got a lot to do with how concepts work. So it's more of, of, of if we think of concepts as stereotypes, which is a, a very important theory, then um, the, the social stereotypes, like being a woman, are have carry value with them. So every time you use those concepts, you are using a stereotype with with value, with moral value or or political or social value. So you you actually this sounds more natural because of the stereotype. Of women we have in this society, and that's not the case with birds. I don't know, but it it just when I saw it, I thought it would be an explanation of why the contrast. Uh, is yeah, shows. yeah, no, that seems that seems um, it definitely seems like one of the things that's going to be going on, right? And so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to contrast, I guess. Arguments that have uh, predicates in that are associated with some social stereotype, um, so Arabs, women, and so and so, um, with something that might seem more unusual, right? Um, so maybe things like uh, either birds or drinks, or although there is a tendency for just about anything to get politicized if you're not if you're not careful. Um, and then separately, not just whether this um, um, category is like stereotypes, but whether this, what we're attributing to it is something dangerous or remarkable. Mm -hmm. or, um, so that, yeah, there's maybe more things to whittle there than, I, than I've been looking at, but yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure this is a fully thought out um, comment, but <clears throat> one thing that struck me towards the end of this is that a lot of the features you want, like failure of transitivity, failure of contraposition, also are features that fail for most. Yes. Yeah. And so I was, I was, now, so I was like, for me, so I mean, most, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. um, now, most will handle things like um, ticks carry Lyme disease, we also put it out, both yeah, have right. to do with danger stuff. So I was wondering if if you had a like super snappy like answer about why this is more promising than just doing this most. I really don't. So at the moment, this is still very um, speculative, yeah. but but that's the kind of thing I want. Like I want to find some features of generics that um, the variable binary quantifiers are going to like predict that they're going to be harder or more complicated to predict with the other the other mechanisms. That's the idea. I want to respond to to right because um or at least I hope again because there's something in, in why this this seems at least to me more promising because in, in cases like the the ticks uh, the ticks carry Lyme disease I, what what this is saying is that we still need to determine the the spheres and this is going to be depend 
um, a lot of things to the context. And so the danger, what it does is, is, is the contextual element that reorders the spheres so that it just becomes the pair of them so together. So that, that's what I think this is more promising. By the way, I have no doubt yours is better than most. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be nice to just, like you said, and have a snappy inference that was valid on one option, not valid on the other, and then you could clearly say whichever one was valid for the generics, that would be ideal. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's what I'm wrestling with. <laughs> yeah. So this might be completely stupid, but that's good. Um, but could could you pack some of this stuff into the quantifier itself? Like you mentioned most, but like something like sufficiently many as to cause concern. Uh, like something something of, of that nature that might be more extensionally uh, evaluable, but would still have that kind of pragmatic element in there. I don't I don't know if like that kind of approach would cover the same cases or, or, or what have you, but I mean I, I could have a quantifier of that kind. I mean it's very anthropic or anthrocentric or something, but sufficiently many to make, mark this out as an issue of public concern. Yeah, I mean so what so is um, this is like a generic quantifier. That's what we express with some bare rules, right? And we could give truth conditions to it, right? And then it will give the truth conditions to all the generics, right? And a different possibility is we say kookaburras are noisy, it's just a generic, no quantifier. Um, but that's like ambiguous between all of these different things. And we, we use context or, you know, maybe we're just lazy sometimes and that. Like somebody has to figure out what we mean out of, uh, presumably I didn't mean no cookie the noisy, but but I might have meant few or I might have meant some or I might have meant all. Um, but of course, the variable binary quantifiers, like I focused on the universal like analog, um, but there's a variable binary um, existential quantifier that's like the mites um, counterfactual, and then you can talk about different relations between the set of things in the sphere and the set of things in the restrictor set and the set of things in the, the other set um, and give different like interpretations to different variable binary quantifiers that way. So it might be, I mean, one possibility is they're always variable binary quantifiers, but generic constructions can express different ones. And we rely on like context to disambiguate. Um, in this. Yeah. So th th yeah, there's like three different possibilities there. Yeah. I guess like what each of these cases, or many of these cases, once they each, but many of the cases have this threshold that's varying, and that threshold seems to be tied to what is my sort of public interest in getting embracing this sentence. Like I tell my children, look, take that Lyme disease because I have a very strong interest in them not getting Lyme disease. And my but it, it you know, my interest in them believing that uh, these weird animals More are still hurt might be a little bit lower or higher. I mean it's mm -hmm. The threshold itself seems to be implicit in each of these cases. And the thing that that's tied to is not necessarily the truth of the sentence, but like my concern for my interlocutor, for example. Right, it's very practical. Yeah, yeah no, that, that seems to be the, um, that seems to be the aspect of the context that's, that's triggering this. Um, I, I just want to make a suggestion that kind of ties in with all of the discussions that have just gone on. Because I think it would be really, really useful in this. Uh, as you, it might just be useful for you. It might be useful depending on which of those options happens to see a comparison between the variable all, the non-variable um, most, and the variable most, where you have mm -hmm. laws and then you do the, the most yeah. in the right. second. Would be really interesting to see how those three interact and, and the strength of them and um, you know sort of inferences between. Them. Um, I think that, right that to try and differentiate. Yeah, that might be worth just working out the technical details of that. Yes, um, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I should do. Yeah. Homework. Yeah. <laughs> but I suspect it's also going to be really cool. So it'll be fun to do. Tricky. Is there any more questions? Um, so I was wondering if there was a simple way like to sketch a plausible explanation with the examples you already have. Uh, because it struck me that if like with no further specification, uh, emus are birds 
could be understood either as all annual Earths, like all of this population falls within this category, or some individuals of the bird category are E, right? Right, so lowercase ate my fruit trees means some of the lowercase ate my fruit trees. Yeah, Whereas... and then what happens is that when perhaps, this is like full speculation, when the terms are more politically loaded, like in women life, we're more inclined to interpret that as all women are liars, unlike the alternative uh, correct interpretation, which is like some individuals of the line that we happen to be women. So I'm not sure about that. Like, I think the exception tolerance is going to be really important because a lot of these cases where people have pretty strong prejudices, um, they do tolerate exceptions that, oh, my sister doesn't lie, but but women lie. I mean, except for her. Or, yeah. um, uh, you know, my, my friend who's black, he's not um, dangerous, but black men are dangerous. You know? But I think that it may be promising because then that will just fall back to the problematic case of most, right? You don't have, like, all of them but most leaning toward even the majority of them. Like perhaps my sister is part of the minority of women, of women which do not lie. Yeah, but we still have to get the tick scores, Lyme disease um, yeah. kind of cases. Um, it does seem like sometimes we mean something a lot like most, and sometimes we mean something like a few key examples, and sometimes we mean all. <laughs> Question. So we can do this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you.